thank you so much, uh, Chicano Studies Research Center, uh, which was, of course, a place that formed me. And uh, Fowler, thank you as well for organizing this symposium today and for inviting us to participate. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about an exhibition that's up right now that's also part of Pacific Standard Time, OSCO, A Lead of the Obscure, a retrospective uh, that I've uh, co-curated with Andi Shaloya, a professor at Williams College. So uh, in my presentation today, more than anything, I am testing out some ideas and thoughts um, almost perhaps too prematurely uh, after co-curating this exhibition. Um, and I want to say, really, I, I so much wish Andine Shavoya could be here because I really consider Andine the archival uh, expert and the exhibition and the catalog that we produced uh, that we produced owes tremendously to the hours upon hours that he spent uh, with archival collections, uh, many of which over the last 15 years he was assisting to identify and, and, and categorize um, as the collections themselves were still in the midst of being processed. Um, and of course, acknowledging Andine's role in being one of the first uh, users of these archival collections, I also have to acknowledge the important work of those who put the collections together. So I'm so honored to be here with Tomas, uh, whose collection we visited and spent time with in Washington, D.C. Um, we didn't get to spend time with Schiffer Goldman's collection because it was really just in the process of being transferred over uh, to UC Santa Barbara, uh, but also to acknowledge uh, Chan Noriega's role in putting together the collection that we used, uh, used both in Stanford and here, of course, at the Chicano Studies Research Center. So as um, Andy and I began to collaborate and spend time together in all of those archives that I just mentioned, uh, we were also in contact with many participants in OSCO who provided that rich layer of explication that first-hand observers can uh, importantly provide. As our historian Liz Coates has written, behind each flyer and announcement card and catalog cover, there are so many stories and memories and also art practices and models. How to transplant these, those multivalent uh, voices and actions into the realm of an exhibition became a challenge for us one that I'm not sure that we were able to transcend, although I'll talk about that a bit right now. I do think that as spies and voyeurs in the archive, that we use the traces and correspondences that emerged in our archival research as tools for thinking through the organization of the exhibition. And to go back to Liz uh, Coates, we battled against the impulse to make a coherent and complete statement for as she writes, that coherence tends to efface the fragmentary, random, and excessive qualities that are integral not only to archives, but also to the histories and events and social networks that they document. <coughs> Andi and I attempted to bring those excessive qualities of the archival collections related to OSCO into the exhibition. Um, I think just reflecting on what Sandra and Draven bring as artists with um, really historiographic consciousness. Both of their practices are very research intensive, but also have uh, almost our artists as curator uh, identities, multiple schizophrenic identities. Um, this is something that Andi and I were, were looking to as models, these types of exhibitions curated by, by artists. So it follows in this presentation, more than a um, completely coherent paper, are some pre preliminary remarks and questions to myself uh, on the stakes of the archive in the context of Oscar's work. Um, more than any other question or comment that I have received over the last two months that the exhibition has been up, um, I've been giving a lot of walkthroughs to, to many students and uh, visiting folks, um, 
is the following question. Are those just documents, or do the artists consider these artworks in, in reference to the photography? This is not a problem unique to OSCO, but one that has plagued artists who work with performance and photography. It certainly is not until recently that performance quote unquote relics, or the photographs of performances, um, which in many cases were not taken by the performative participants, but by photographers that were commissioned to be there and frame the actions, this isn't the case with Oscar, of course, um, have had any play in the market. Looking at the contact sheets of Seymour Rosen and Ricardo Valverde, two photographers that were on the scene coincidentally and captured Osco in action on the streets, it is evident that a performance is taking place through time and is being chronicled. But looking at this example uh, of a no movie by Osco, once the pose is harnessed by Osco, especially through their extensive experimentation with the no movie format, the lines between performance and photography are thoroughly blurred. So much of what we see emerging in contemporary art in terms of pho photographic experimentation in the 18, 1980s and 90s owes everything to such a blurring of distinctions. As performance art historian Rosie Lee Gerb Goldberg has stated, this lowly thing we call artist documentation has dramatically changed photography. <laughs> Osco played a part in that. Osco's Nomuli cover for the last issue of Regeneración also shows how the, group's, uh, how the group's photographic sessions could be deployed in various formats. And placing the issue alongside the drawings uh, of Osco members, as we did in the retrospective, um, as well as situating that work within early experiments um, with photographic collage and text and image pieces, we hope to give a sense of the atmosphere that Colin Gunkel describes in his essay for the, for the Oscar catalog. Um, Gronk quoted in, in Colin's essay describes the journal of the Generacion thusly. It was the meeting place. It called us together to talk about what was going, what was going to go out into the streets and to do the live pieces that were going to unfold and take place. So the curatorial strategy, placing those drawings and uh, the layout, layouts for the magazine with the images of the earliest street actions uh, was an attempt uh, by us, the curators, to depict the contingency of these practices and the fluidity between these practices. I think it was also a way to show that ephemera is not neutral and that those material remains are spaces, uh, like the one that Brock's describing, spaces where practices evolved and uh, are enacted. Of course, um, one of the, the problems we have placing these as, you know, these elements, these material remains, this ephemera uh, within a museum, where we're placing them on acid-free uh, boards within a vitrine, we run the risk of basically um, deactivating some of these uh, some of these very things that I'm describing. Um, such as trying to depict the, the role of these uh, pieces in the elaboration of practices and processes. Another aspect of Osco's work that became increasingly apparent through the archival research, through reading interviews with the artists and piecing together how and in where their work was shown, was the open-endedness of the format. Osco's photographs were not mere material traces of an action, but were the sites where meanings became activated and dispersed. So they could use an image like this uh, and circulate it as false publicity. This is the decoy gaming warfare. Um, or in novellas such as uh, Harry Gamboa's, with Harry Gamboa in collaboration with, with uh, Osco, X's party. As we noted in our curatorial essay, the no movie concept and later the photo novella allowed a flexible format of production and reproduction that provided Osco the opportunity to, also, to explore all sorts of media as well as ideas about the mass media.
Images that emanated from photographic sessions would take mul multiple iterations as mail art, photographs, Super 8 films, and slideshows. Such creative use of the material signals Osco's interest not only in economic formal means, but also in the conceptual possibilities of the outtake, or the alternate shot. Um, Osco's com complex and multiple use of the image was something that Andine and I attempted to play with at various points and through uh, different types of presentations. So with Harry's consent here, we projected a few images of the photonovela Pseudotorkoisers throughout the exhibition uh, as a sequence of wall murals. Uh, I have only five minutes, and I just wanted to um, kind of fast forward. Then it asks us to talk about surprises and revelations um, I have to kind of pass up this. I wanted. I was gonna. I wrote up a little bit about the the backsides of, of, of some things that we were able to show and the sort of hidden uh, not code, but the, the sort of hidden uh, signals and historical uh, meanings that that reside uh, that, were, were, that we weren't able to display. But when you turn the no movie award nominations that you see on the left. When you turn that over, you see the the lace head, uh, the letterhead for lace, and that really gives you a sense over two years or so of lace's involvement in the programming and really giving uh, really early on in lace's history uh, a real connection to Latin America uh, because they did actually a number of uh, Latino and, and Latin American exhibitions that were that Harry and Brock were involved in. Um, I wanted to talk too, but I won't I get to talk about Rigeneración uh, and how the designers were really attracted to uh, archival elements, and the book designers um, were also really uh, involved in, in archival research. But um, the things that were really revelations to me uh, and were a part of Andine and my uh, curatorial strategy of, of widening the, the network of our, of our interests and our research, uh, we're bringing in some of the collaborations of Gronk, um, and in particular, well, I'll back up to talk about that, but um, the collaborations between Gronk and Teddy Sandoval. This is a work we desperately wanted to include but couldn't find, uh, a work of Teddy Sandoval that links uh, Teddy's work to Gronk through the punk rock magazine Slash, and also works in some images of another collaborator of Gronk, uh, Jerry Dreva. Just read a little bit, um, just about, just to, just to, just to conclude. Um, the forms and protocols of correspondence and correspondence art, uh, that's correspondence art, mail art that, that Jerry Dreva got um, Osco involved in, got Gronk involved in, uh, were also, also influenced the curatorial process. As we attempted to replicate this notion of contact and correspondence, um, uh, and, and I was thinking about Griselda Pollock writing about uh, uh, us as archives, as spies and voyeurs, uh, subject to fantasies and identifications, idealizations and misrecognitions as we work in the archive. Um, the permeable formats of Osco and their collaborators gave us an opportunity to play a bit with these fantasies as art historians and scholars. Um, so I think I'll just wind up there and give us some time to have a conversation. Thank you.